Have you ever wondered what would really happen if Dead Space's necromorphs were real? Forget everything you think about surviving horror outbreaks. This isn't about whether you could barricade yourself in a mall or find the perfect hideout. Isaac Clarke had plot armor and immunity that wouldn't exist in real life. A real necromorph outbreak would be a species-ending event the moment a single marker activated anywhere on Earth. Unlike zombies that shamble around looking for fresh meat, necromorphs are engineered biological weapons that get stronger when you fight them. The infection doesn't even need living hosts to spread. Today, we're breaking down three reasons why a real necromorph outbreak would be impossible to contain. The marker signal that rewires human brains from miles away, the instant reanimation process that turns every dead body into a weapon, and why every single containment protocol we have would fail catastrophically. Let's start with the most terrifying part, the marker signal itself. In dead space, these alien artifacts don't just raise the dead, they actively corrupt living humans through some kind of psychic transmission that affects brain chemistry and neural pathways. Now, we don't have psychic signals in real life, but we do have something eerily similar, prion diseases. Prions are misfolded proteins that can literally rewrite how your brain works at the cellular level. Mad cow disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, fatal familial insomnia. These conditions spread through neural networks, corrupting healthy brain tissue and turning it into more prions. The maker signal works like a prion disease on steroids. It doesn't need physical contact or contaminated material. It broadcasts directly into human consciousness, and once it takes a hold, it spreads through your nervous system like wildfire. Here's where quarantine zones become completely useless. Traditional disease containment works because you can isolate the infected area and prevent physical transmission. But the marker signal affects people miles away from the source. Imagine trying to contain a COVID infection if it could infect people through radio waves. You'd have outbreaks popping up simultaneously across entire continents. The signal also creates what I call the dementia effect. Before people even start showing physical symptoms, their rational decision-making breaks down. They become paranoid, violent, and start hearing voices telling them to make us whole. This isn't like other fictional mind control where people just become mindless drones. The marker preserves enough intelligence to make victims actively work against containment efforts. Compare this to other mind control scenarios in fiction. Professor X's telepathy requires direct focus and proximity. The One Ring's corruption takes years or decades. Even the Borg assimilation needs physical contact with nanoprobes. The marker signal is uniquely unstoppable because it operates at the speed of electromagnetic radiation across unlimited range. But here's the truly horrifying part, the convergence process. The marker doesn't just wait for people to die naturally. It starts converting living humans into biological weapons while they're still alive. Their bodies begin producing the enzymes and proteins needed for necromorph transformation. By the time someone dies, their corpse is already primed for immediate reanimation. Think about what this means in practice. A marker activates near a major city. Within hours, millions of people are hearing voices and losing their sanity. Within days, they're unconsciously preparing their own bodies for conversion. The moment the first person dies from violence, accident, or the stress of the signal, you don't get one necromorph, you get thousands all activating simultaneously across the entire affected area. The signal also disrupts electromagnetic equipment and communication systems. Just when authorities need coordination the most, their command structures start breaking down. Radio chatter becomes garbled with phantom voices. Computer systems start displaying marker symbols. Personnel at every level of government and military begin succumbing to dementia effects. This creates a cascade failure where the very people responsible for containment become the primary vector for spread. Unlike a zombie bite that you can see coming, the marker signals turn your own allies into unknowing saboteurs before they even realize they're infected. Now let's talk about what happens when someone actually dies during a marker outbreak. This is where necromorphs become a completely different threat than any zombie or infected creature we've seen in other fiction. Normal decomposition is a passive process. It takes weeks or months, and the corpse becomes less dangerous over time, not more. But necromorph reanimation flips this entire process on its head. When a marker-affected corpse reanimates, it doesn't just shamble around with whatever body parts it had when it died. The dead tissue becomes incredibly active, reconstructing itself at the cellular level. Bones grow and reshape into bladed weapons. 
Muscle fibers reorganize to create superhuman strength. Skin and connective tissue form new appendages that never existed in the original human anatomy. In real life, this kind of biological engineering happens during embryonic development, when stem cells differentiate into specialized tissue. But that process takes months and requires a living circulatory system to deliver nutrients and oxygen. Necromorphs somehow accomplish the same level of biological complexity in minutes or hours using dead tissue with no blood flow. They're essentially performing advanced genetic engineering on themselves using nothing but raw materials from a single human corpse. It's like watching a car spontaneously rebuild itself into a tank using only its original parts. But here's where it gets really terrifying. Cutting off limbs makes them stronger. When you shoot the arm off a slasher, those blade-tipped appendages don't just fall to the ground and stop moving. They continue functioning as independent weapons, and the main body grows new limbs to replace what you removed. This suggests necromorphs operate on a distributed nervous system, similar to how octopuses have neural clusters in each tentacle. Necromorphs seem to have solved the fundamental problem of coordinating complex movement without a centralized brain or circulatory system. Compare this to other fictional infected creatures. Resident Evil zombies are just reanimated corpses with basic motor functions. They shamble, they bite, they eventually decay. Last of Us infected retain human anatomy with fungal modifications, but they're still bound by normal biological limitations. Even the most advanced infected, like bloaters, are just heavily armored versions of the original human form. Necromorphs completely abandoned human anatomy. A lurker isn't a human with modifications. It's a human torso that's grown three tentacles with bone spikes and somehow learned to crawl on walls. A brute is a human that's become a living battering ram with armored skin and massive bone clubs for arms. These aren't mutations or infections, they're complete biological redesigns. The energy requirements for this kind of transformation should be impossible. Muscle contraction requires ATP, which comes from cellular respiration. But dead tissue can't perform cellular respiration because there's no oxygen delivery system. Somehow, necromorphs are generating enough power to move with superhuman speed and strength while their cells should be completely inert. The closest real-world parallel might be anaerobic bacteria that can function without oxygen, but even they need some form of chemical energy source. Necromorphs seem to violate thermodynamics by creating energy from nothing, which makes them infinitely more dangerous than any realistic biological threat. This brings us to why the aim for the limbs strategy would fail catastrophically in real combat. The games make dismemberment look easy because you're playing as Isaac Clark with advanced engineering tools designed for precision cutting. But real soldiers use bullets, explosives, and conventional weapons designed to stop threats through organ damage or blood loss. Military training teaches center mass shots because that's where vital organs are located. But necromorphs don't have vital organs in the traditional sense. Shooting a slasher in the chest just wastes ammunition. You need to completely sever limbs with surgical precision while under extreme stress, in poor lighting, against targets that move faster than Olympic sprinters. Those severed limbs are still dangerous and the main body is already regenerating. You're not winning the fight, you're just changing the tactical situation in ways that favor the enemy. Here's where the true horror of a necromorph outbreak becomes clear. Every single containment strategy we have is designed for living pathogens. Our entire biohazard response system assumes we're dealing with viruses, bacteria, or other organisms that need living hosts to survive and reproduce. But necromorphs don't need living hosts. They need dead ones. And here's the problem. We have dead bodies everywhere. Think about this for a second. Every city has multiple hospitals, morgues, funeral homes, and cemeteries. Every major disaster leaves behind human remains. In a normal outbreak, these are just sad reminders of lives lost. In a necromorph outbreak, their weapon caches waiting to be activated. The moment a marker signal reaches a metropolitan area, you're not just dealing with the living population that's going insane. You're dealing with every corpse in every morgue, suddenly becoming an active threat. A city of one million living people might have 50,000 bodies in various stages of preservation just sitting there, ready to reanimate. Our standard operating procedures for biohazard containment involve establishing kill zones and eliminating infective individuals before they can spread the disease. But every person you kill during a necromorph outbreak just adds to the enemy's numbers. Imagine special forces teams clearing a contaminated hospital. In a zombie outbreak, you shoot the infected, secure the building, and move on. In a necromorph outbreak, 
every person you're forced to kill immediately stands back up as something far more dangerous than what you just fought. Compare this to how we handled COVID-19. Despite massive global coordination efforts, advanced warning systems, and months of preparation time, we still struggled to contain a virus that spreads through respiratory droplets. Now imagine trying to coordinate that same response when your communication systems are compromised, your personnel are going insane, and the threat spreads faster than information can travel. Let's run the numbers. A typical cruise ship carries about 3,000 people. In a normal outbreak, you might see gradual infection over days or weeks, giving you time to quarantine and respond. But a marker-affected ship would see the entire population succumb to dementia effects within hours. The moment people start dying from violence, panic, or accidents, you get 3,000 necromorphs activating simultaneously. The ship reaches the port, and now you have a major metropolitan area with millions of people all receiving the marker signal at once. Within 24 hours, you're not dealing with an outbreak anymore. You're dealing with the complete conversion of human civilization into something else entirely. Real-world pandemic response assumes you can identify, track, and isolate cases before they spread. But necromorph outbreaks don't spread through contact or proximity. They spread through death itself. And in a world with 7.8 billion people and millions dying from natural causes every day, you have a constant supply of new recruits for the enemy army. The final nail in the coffin is that conventional weapons make the situation worse. Every bomb you drop creates more corpses. Every battle you fight leaves behind more raw material for reanimation. You can't win through superior firepower when your victories actively strengthen the enemy. So how did humanity survive in the Dead Space universe? The game makes it look like the necromorph threat can be contained and eventually defeated, but when you examine the solutions from a scientific perspective, they fall apart completely. Isaac Clarke's immunity is the biggest plot convenience in the entire franchise. He can resist the marker signal because of his unique brain chemistry and exposure patterns. In the real world, this kind of natural immunity doesn't exist for neurological pathogens. Prion diseases affect everyone who gets exposed. There's no genetic variant that makes you immune to having your brain proteins misfold. Even if someone had partial resistance to the marker signal, they wouldn't be completely unaffected. They might last longer before succumbing to dementia effects. The marker destruction solution is even more scientifically implausible. In the games, destroying a marker stops the signal and causes active necromorphs to become inert. But if the signal works like any real electromagnetic phenomenon, destroying the source doesn't instantly stop transmissions that are already propagating through space. The game suggests that destroying one marker stops all necromorph activity in the area. But if the reanimation process involves actual biological changes at the cellular level, those changes wouldn't just reverse themselves when the signal stops. Dead tissue that's been reconstructed into weapons and new appendages wouldn't magically return to normal human anatomy. The games show government forces maintaining organized resistance for months or years after initial outbreaks. They have functioning command structures, coordinated military operations, and enough technological capability to build new markers for research purposes. Real governments would collapse much faster. The timeline in Dead Space gives humanity decades to study markers and develop countermeasures. But this assumes stable institutions and rational scientific inquiry can continue during an active outbreak. In reality, the dementia effects would cripple research efforts before anyone could understand what they were dealing with. The final truth is that once a marker activates anywhere on Earth, convergence becomes inevitable. The signal would propagate globally through our interconnected communication networks. Every major population center would experience simultaneous outbreaks. Every military response would create more casualties, which would create more necromorphs. Unlike the games where Isaac Clarke can fight his way through isolated incidents, a real necromorph outbreak would be a species-ending event. There would be no immune protagonists, no convenient plot devices, and no way to destroy the source before it's too late. So there you have it. Necromorphs represent the perfect unstoppable threat because they attack humanity at every level simultaneously. The marker signal corrupts our minds before we even know we're under attack. The reanimation process turns our own dead against us in ways that make conventional weapons useless, and our entire containment infrastructure becomes counterproductive when every death feeds the enemy. This is what makes Dead Space genuinely terrifying from a scientific perspective. It's not just another zombie outbreak you might survive with enough preparation and luck. 
It's a complete inversion of everything we understand about life, death, and biological warfare. If you enjoyed this breakdown on why humanity would be doomed, make sure to subscribe for more scientific analyses of your favorite horror franchises. Thank you.